TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. We're here to entertain you, we'll sing your songs, for good times, the best times, you can't go wrong, we'll two-step, a new step, it won't be long, when the Dixieland is up playing, soon you'll be swaying, so come on, sing along. Hello and welcome to another episode of Before My Time. I am your host, Gelsey Laurie, and this week we're going to talk about my namesake, Gelsey Kirkland. Join us. What's up, everybody? This is Brian here to tell you about our podcast, Bingetown TV. Our hosts include seven best friends with a love for all things television. We cover a range of genres with a focus on fantasy and sci-fi, but also dip our feet into drama, horror, comedy, and pretty much anything we think is good television. We use the traditional deep dive formula for new live shows that are released week to week, but our calling card is our Rooks and Vets and Pitchtown TV series. Rooks and Vets pairs two of our hosts that have seen a show with two of our hosts that have not seen a show. Pitchtown TV is when we have a special guest pitch us a show by having us watch the pilot and trying to convince us to watch the rest. If you're craving more content on some of your favorite TV shows, then you should listen to Bingetown TV. Find us on our website at bingetowntv.com, the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or wherever else you may find your podcast. So, Gelsey. Yes. You want us to talk about Gelsey. I do, because I'm that conceited. I was like, <laughs> I want to talk about Gelsey today. No, Matt, a lot of us, you know, you might know, you might never have met another Gelsey. And most people I meet are like, Gelsey, Kelsey or Gelsey? I'm like, it's Gelsey. They're like, where does that name come from? And I'm like, well, let me tell you. And I thought, why don't I tell all of you listeners here where that name comes from? Because you're probably going, you might not give two shits, but I know most of you are asking, where does that name come from? So I... <laughs> was named after a famous ballerina in the 70s, Gelsey Kirkland. My mother is a dancer, so she was like, I want my daughters to have ballet names. And Gelsey Kirkland, this is a, she's a really interesting person because she is not just, I'm not going to be like, she worked really hard and then danced and everyone said, yay, and she's famous. Like, <laughs> she's got quite, she's kind of, I, call, I like to like consider her as like, she's like fucking rock and roll of ballet and not necessarily in a light, like the more like, motley crew dark side of ballet where you're like damn that got deep and that's kind of sad so gelsey kirkland was born december 29th 1952 she grew up one of three in a quiet farm in pennsylvania Aww. ironically she didn't talk for her first two years i mean babies don't talk in their first year but she was really quiet and, and past two years old she wasn't talking and there's a quote where she said little did anyone suspect that someday i would speak with silence that i would make a career out of being seen but not heard so she kind of relates to that at an early age. Um, due to financial difficulties, the family had to move from the farm to an apartment in New York City. Her father, Jack, lapsed into alcoholism and outbreaks of fury. So that threw Gelsey into struggling between intense love and resentment for her father, which comes back later in her life as themes in trying to please men and get their approval. Um, it always is down to daddy and mommy issues, isn't it? Always. And that always. And um, her mother, Nancy, was on the other side, very overprotective because of that 
but also kind of did some damage in that way. Uh, she says, by devoting myself to the discipline of dance, I was able to establish a measure of control that was otherwise lacking in my life, or so it seemed. So not a great stable upbringing, but at eight years old, she auditioned for the School of American Ballet, which is um, called SAB. SAB was founded, as a little side note, in 1934 by a choreographer, George Balanchine. And that school feeds into the New York City Ballet. So those of you who don't know, if you, you have to audition still, SAB is one of the most prestigious ballet schools and academies to go into that then feeds into one of the most prestigious ballet companies. Um, they have a very, even to this day, I was a ballerina growing up and we would do like summer programs and you audition for different summer intensives that are four to six weeks long. You go when you're like, you can go, I think as early as 10 at some, but normally like 11 to 15 and you go away for summers and SAB, like I walked into that audition and you stand there and they just look at your bodies and you point your foot out into what is called a tondu to the side and hold it. And they just walk up and down and write on their notepad. It's still kind of like that. Oh, it's still very much like that. They are all very thin, tall leg extension up to their head. It's there's a, they've got a vibe. Uh, Gelsey Lori is not that vibe. Gelsey Kirkland is. <laughs> so, hey, so her sister, Joanna was already a student there. And so when she was eight years old, she auditioned and was placed in the first division. And Gelsey Kirkland was furious. She thought she was only accepted because of her sister. And she said that anger I felt after that first audition became one of the guiding emotions of my entire career. Oh, damn. So <laughs> bitch holds a grudge. And she studied there for eight years. And she also did some part-time modeling as a child to get some money. When she's 15 years old, she joins the New York City Ballet and she's their youngest member. That is 15, that is young to be in the corps de ballet. Corps de ballet, for those of you who don't know, is tech. It literally means the body of the ballet. It's like the backbone of the company and they work as the backdrop to the principals. So in Swan Lake, when you have the soloists up front dancing, the girls that are lined up on the sides in a pose and like literally don't move the entire 20 minute chunk of the ballet, that's them. It is one, it's such a hard job. Those girls work for peanuts and it is still so cutthroat to like be in the back of the line. It's insane. She did that. Um, she stops modeling and she leaves school after 11th grade, which I was like tripping out reading like these details. Cause I knew about her, but I started ballet when I was eight. She started ballet when she was eight. She left high school at 11th grade. I left high school at 11th grade. Oh my God. Like, you're her. I'm her. It was oh, more no. than just a namesake. Ooh, I hope not, because it's about to get worse. Oh, so, no. This yeah, is like the last healthy. time we claimed that you were the embodiment of someone. <laughs> I know. Why do I always think that I'm these tragic people? It's like, I'm. oh, gosh, I hope not. Okay. So in 1970, she dances the Sugar Plum Fairy in the Nutcracker, and it she becomes critically acclaimed and moved to a soloist from the Court of Ballet. Um, which you go from, it's Court of Ballet, soloist, principal dancers, how companies work. And Balanchine, um, who is the director of the company, who's the one that founded it, George Balanchine, chooses her to dance the, his title role of his 1949 revival of Firebird. She is 17 years old at this point. The media blows up. She becomes an immediate superstar. She, um, Life magazine writes a six-page spread on her. She's in Dance Magazine, Forbes, 17, the Saturday Review. She did say, though, everyone seemed to have an angle on me except me. So she's starting, you know, she's kind of, she's 17. She's super impressionable. She's losing herself to this idea of who she is and to Balanchine, who had rigorous demands of his dancers. Like he expected them to completely lose themselves for this art and to form themselves to what he wanted. Um, Gelsey starts starving herself and falls into anorexia and bulimia. She surgically alters her face and body. So if you all, I'll post photos and stuff. She, she has fillers. I mean, she's got huge lip fillers, plastic surgery on her face. And she danced through many of painful injuries um, that she should have been out. Um, and one time she wrote a book, which we'll talk about, but um, in her book, she writes about feeling extremely ill before a performance and Balanchine, um, gave her a pill to take, calling it a quote unquote vitamin. And after her spirits were picked up and he gave her another for future use. And Kirkland claims that those were undoubtedly amphetamines. He's like, here, take this vitamin. You don't feel good. So he's already, you know, it's, it's, she's fallen into this 
get, do whatever you want, which ballet does have that mentality already. I mean, I think it was a lot worse then, but it still is. Even growing up, it was like, I would, my shoes would be full of blood and they're like, do it again and better. You're like, great. That smile. Was like, I think you and I have talked about this, um, I think off the air, but there was mm-hmm. a time where it was not too long ago when the winter Olympics were happening and we were just talking about the difference between like watching the snowboard competitors versus say the figure skating competitors, Mm -hmm. you know, you get that vibe from the snowboard competitors of like, they just want to see their, their fellow competitors do some cool shit. And like, if they don't win, but like that person does something that they've never seen before, they're just like, Oh hell yeah, that's awesome. Good for you, man. But like the figure skaters, you can see like that. Those are just people who have pushed themselves all to be the absolute best. And how dare anyone even try to be better than them yeah. type attitude. Like I, I feel like that moves right into the, the ballet and dance world pretty seamlessly oh, as well. The ballet world is, is, you know, I would say, yeah, all of those figure skating, gymnastics, ballet, but I don't think I've met a world as brutal as ballet. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, there's a reason why I there's multiple it. horror movies that are based around competitive ballerina <laughs> stuff you know what oh, I mean yeah like, yeah it's it's a theme for a reason <laughs> oh yeah and it's well I have I'll get to this an interesting quote later by a psychiatrist who studied Gelsey and what he, what he says is very like oh shit like very real but Balanchina was was yeah um, he's a Russian and just has that very strict approach um and Gelsey said that there were not supposed to be any stars in his theater who might distract or steal thunder from his choreography and that he stripped the dancers of their individuality so even the soloists it was like he wanted them to be I think in one of her quotes says like I was just like a dance robot machine to be you know is she just losing herself more and more in 1970 and 71 she continues to dance those seasons doing various leads I'm not going to go into what they are because people will be like I don't know what that means but you know doing great and then in 1972 she gets moved to a principal in the company but she does start to rebel at this point she starts training other places she storms out of rehearsals um there kind of becomes this pull back and forth you know I, I think with that and then she meets uh Mikhail Brzhnikov who is in his own right, like this incredible, I mean, he's a legend in the ballet world. So she leaves New York City Ballet to go dance with Brzhnikov at American Ballet Theater, ABT. They are dance partners, but they also fall into a romance. So they're romantic partners as well. And this kind of goes into, he also had a very certain image of what a partner, a woman should be, what that role was. And so she falls into being strong enough to leave Balanchine and replaces it with Brzhnikov, who is also just as abusive in different ways. And so it kind of goes into that theme again, where she's just trying to please, please men. And she, it starts from her father. Like she, she writes that after one time a school performance, her father attends, she said, I knew I would be judged by the only person other than myself whom it was impossible to please. And that is, whoa. Mm -hmm. So then Years later, she says about her relationships with Balanchine and Brzhnikov, she said, I had rebelled for years against Balanchine's modern vision of the ballerina. It seemed that I had to revolt against Misha's romantic image of womanhood as well. Uh, Misha is Brzhnikov. Between those two Russian men, my little insurrection in the name of love and reason would bound to put me down. I was easily disarmed. I was at a loss, held under the spell for those men in my life from whom I sought approval. I could neither appease nor resist them. That's kind of shows that theme. And she was aware of it, you know, later in her life when she goes through reflection time, but um, definitely stems from her father. And now, so she's replaced Balanchine with Brzhnikov and um, they danced together. The Pas de Deux from Don Quixote, October 22nd, 1974 is kind of their big performance. And it's a huge success. Um, And the press really notes, like she had already been getting a lot of notoriety, but a lot of the press and articles written about her were like, oh, she's so pristine and and we can't wait to see the dancer she's going to become. You know, they still knew she's 15, 16, 17. And this was the first time they know that, wow, now dancing with Brzhnikov, you can see her full blossom of the maturity in her dancing. And she has become that. So it really put her up there. And she dances um, in ABT, one of 
the heart is considered one of the hardest roles for a ballerina is the role of Giselle in the ballet Giselle, which side note, ironically, is my sister's name. So Gelsey danced Giselle. <laughs> Clever how mom. That, how did that work out? <laughs> hmm. No correlation there. In an article written about her, it was said it was the coming together of a dancer in a role that had been made for each other. Since her school days, Miss Kirkland had justifiably been the darling of ballet. But here, irrefutably, was the emergence of a great American ballerina. She did not put a foot, a hand, or even a gesture wrong. It was the fairy tale debut little girls dream about. And that was about her dancing of Giselle. In 1976, I do you know the film in 1976, there was a movie called The Turning Point. It's a really famous ballet mm-hmm. movie in the late 70s. And it's kind of zeroes in on what a ballerina's life is and blah, blah, blah. So um, Gelsey was contracted to star in that movie, but she didn't like the script and kind of was unhappy with things. And it threw her into a regression of being under Balanchine's thumb. And so she started starving herself again, going into anorexia, bulimia. She got down to 80 pounds, which highly jeopardized her health. She was so tiny. And then Brizhnikov, her relationship's starting to fall apart. He's having many affairs and, and into infidelities. So that's fun. Um, and the press, they still dance together and everyone kind of thinks it's all right, but there definitely is like a separation and Gelsey says, had I been able to speak as well as dance, I might have won the support of those who, like me, longed for a dance that portrayed the human drama with more depth depth and diversity. Such a dance was a seemingly impossible dream. I never uttered such ambitious words about my art, even to myself, without feeling of absolute loneliness and derangement. The fanatical extremes of my commitment isolated me. So that's sad. And kind of shows where she was at. So yeah, that's, whoa. Brzezhnikov leaves American Ballet Theater and, and goes to New York City Ballet. And she, their romance is broken. She has a couple new dance partners. But in 1980, Brzezhnikov returns to the dictatorship role at American Ballet Theater. So now he's the director of the company Gelsey's dancing for. And so now we have that new dynamic, which <laughs> that's healthy, right? Yeah, that's very, um, that's good. Yeah. So Gelsey's extremely overwhelmed with despair. And one of her fellow dancers is like, Hey, you heard about this thing called cocaine? And she's like, let's try it. So she starts up cocaine and, and goes into a wicked drug addiction. She's still fooling critics and audiences at this point. You know, everyone's like, she's so beautiful in this. And her first like coked out performance, she got like, oh my God, she dances like water. And they like raged because she has like all this energy. But she said she was an accomplice of her own destruction. And she was a total wreck. I was dying. Both my brain and body were out of order. So they do start to see a decline in reviews. Like I think people start catching on in 1981. um, There was a review of her dancing um, and it said it was the saddest exhibition given by a dancer whose artistry is increasingly placed at the service of a gift from mimicry. She danced. She's dancing the public's idea of Gelsey Kirkland as a star. So that's kind of where that's going because you can't just keep going with not on on drug addiction not eating properly through you know so she abt dismisses her and rehires her multiple times she's you know meeting different drug dealers she has a brain seizure and um she gets confinement in a mental institution so a lot going on there for for gelsey and this is where in her psych evaluation um her doctor wrote her personality had not been integrated at some early stage of development the same observation might have applied to virtually every dancer i knew whether anorexic or addicted or not two out of every 10 were trying to starve or poison themselves to death why most dancers seem to accept the popular aesthetic as well as the authority figures of the ballet world so Mm. that's what i was talking about earlier when you know even this doctor knew it's not like she mentally had a problem and couldn't handle the ballet world. It was like, no, this is the ballet world. And had it been any other dancer coming to me, I would see the same thing, which yeah. shows you how fucked up ballet is. Um, uh, and it's also beautiful. And it's also my, my start and where I learned a lot. So I obviously have a very huge love. Ironically, the last, the, the ballet that my school was doing was a 36 minute ballet piece called Serenade, which is a George Balanchine piece. And that piece is what led me to leave ballet and the rehearsal process and the mental and just the realize that I was like, 
fuck this. I don't like this. Like this isn't, and I was such a disciplined kid at such an early age and I still am. I mean, and that's ballet taught me that. And I, I, it's how it pushed me into other careers um, within entertainment that I succeeded so well was because I knew how to, I know how to turn that thing on in my brain and be like tunnel vision. I'm joining the circus. I'm going to be the best I can and this and that and focus um, to a fault sometimes. And I've not near as bad as Gelsey Kirkland, but I, I've gone down some roads that she has to no nowhere to her drama, but um, in lieu of my art and I get it. And it's, it's, um, yeah, it definitely takes over. And I think ballet taught me that at a very young age. So I can see, but in, um, ironically in 1983, uh, she meets Greg Lawrence, who was a writer and manager of TV. And she met him at a drug dealer's place. Um, cause he was also a cocaine addict, but he, in the future, they end up getting together and getting married in the future. And he's the one that convinces Gelsey to confront her drug addiction, even though he was too. So in 1984, Gelsey resigns from ballet. She moves upstate with Greg to a place in New York upstate. I think some friends let them stay for a while. And for two years, they they get clean together and she examines the destructions of her life and where everything comes from. And And while she does that, kind of the final piece of her healing is writing an autobiography called Dancing on My Grave. So if you want to dive more into the stories and the actual deep, you know, affairs and this and that that go on with Gelsey, I would highly recommend reading Dancing on My Grave. A year later, 1985, she marries Greg Lawrence. And in 1986, she comes back and performs her last role in Romeo and Juliet and then retires after. In 2010, she started the Gelsey Kirkland Academy of Classical Ballet, um, which fed into a company. The company sadly closed in 2021, like many companies. But um, she's all dandy now, and she teaches. I was really sad. I had an opportunity to meet her when I lived in New York. She was teaching ballet classes, and I just, for some reason, the day she was teaching a different studio, I I didn't get there, um, which I regret. So I still hope I can meet her one day. But that is the just barely scratching the surface of Gelsey Kirkland, one of the most famous ballerinas. Um, Like I said, I feel like she really was lived that rock and roll side of ballet. You know, it's another funny thing. Her dad's name was Jack. My name's dad is Jack. What is happening? I know. I know. (laughs) My mom told me this kind of side note, but she walked in and I was doing notes on it. And I was like, oh, mom, I'm doing an episode on Gelsey Kirkland. She's like, oh my God, really? She said, Gelsey Kirkland is the first ballerina I ever saw dance. She was, oh, it was on shit. TV. They televised the Nutcracker. That was one of her most famous roles was Gelsey Kirkland danced as Clara in the Nutcracker. And that was with Brzezhnikov. And very famous. I grew up with that tape and I used to watch it all the time because I was like, oh my gosh. And I did the Nutcracker for eight years and I would watch that. And I was like, I want to be Clara so bad. And I would just hone in, hone in. And so I got to dance as Clara in my Nutcracker for two years. And I was like, I'm Gelsey and I get to do Clara. Now my Clara was a lot more of a cute version compared to her. Like she's the principal, but still like it meant so much to me that I was doing this role that my namesake had done. And, but that was, yeah, she was the first ballerina my mom ever saw. And then that, you know, my mom became a dancer, opened a dance studio, which is funny because I think she liked the name Giselle better, I guess. So that's why Giselle's older and she got that first. <laughs> Hi listeners. I'm Carolina. And I'm Tessa. And together we are Femme Regard Podcast. Mm, Femme. We are a show dedicated to educating and entertaining underdeveloped filmmakers and film enthusiasts alike. We love sharing our experiences as filmmakers, what we've learned and what we've gone through. And we love bringing on professional industry guests. We want our listeners to learn from the best and get an honest account of the biz. So come join the Fem Fam and give us a listen every Friday. Streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including YouTube and our website, femregard.com. And of course, the Geekscape Network. So, Gelsey, I have to tell you that I think it's really cool that you and your sister both actually have namesakes because I don't think any of my siblings are named after anybody. All four of us are like, there's you no just lie. Like, there's yeah, there was no that. you could be like Matthew no McConaughey and they'd be like, that doesn't make sense with the timeline. He wasn't. Shh. Shh. I mean, I, so so I will say that a uh, listener of the show, Lauren, I won't say her last name, but my friend Lauren. Uh, when she had her second kid, they were like, we're not even going to have a gender. Like, we're not going to know what the gender is until the baby's born. Oh, that would which, kill me. 
which is so stressful because then they had to come up with a name on the fly. So they had the names like, oh, if it's a girl, we'll name it this. If it's a boy, we'll name it this. Right. Mm -hmm. Then they look at this baby and they're like, I don't know. None of these names seem to to match with this baby. Right. So I go to visit. I'm I'm if I'm able to, I try to be like one of the first friends to visit. Uh, when a baby's born, I just want to really establish that this child knows to you love wanna me. You want to imprint. You yeah, want to the imprint on the child. Uncle. Just stare. Yes. Yeah. At this time, I'm just holding this nameless child. And <laughs> and there's a list of names on the chalkboard. And I'm like, why don't you put Matt up there and name him after his soon to be favorite uncle? And like I said that jokingly. Uh, so a couple days later, they send me a text message with the baby's full name. And his middle name was Matthew. It was. Aww. And they're like, what do you think on the name that we settled on? And I said, I love it. But why is his first name in between the middle name and the last? Name? <laughs> <laughs> That's the closest I've had to a tie to a namesake. I know that you and I have both been pretty open about the fact that neither one of us ever wants to have a child. But Matt, it's changing for me. I don't I don't know if I do. Oh, no. OK, so I like, know. let's say let's say you do have a child. Would yeah. do you have a what would you what is something that you love so much you'd be like, I want to name them blank? Uh I literally whatever gender. the other week was talking to my friend and I was talking about like this kid I don't have. And I was like, because I always pretend like I'm gonna have a little boy because I know life would give me a girl just because their life's an asshole. But and I was like, you know do you, what people don't you don't hear anymore of like boys' names or ever? Tarzan. Wouldn't that be a dope <laughs> ass kid? I know. <laughs> I want to name my little boy Tarzan, but names like that are, are kind of mean because like either that's the coolest kid and he's going to be like this crazy, like definitely would do parkour. But if he's just like, like a dorky but if he's like kid a, oh, man, named Tarzan, he's going to get so bullied. And like it's names like that, like you really have to hope that the kid lives up to him. So I would never name my kid Tarzan, but. I told you in the Zelda episode, Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. I, I've been thinking about that because I do think that Fitzy oh, is just such a dope nickname. Yeah. <laughs> I like names um, that like could fly in the 20s and 30s that you don't hear anymore. See, now in, in my brain, as I'm thinking about this, I'd be like, I would go with Jim because that's my dad's first name, but also mm. like Jim Henson. You know what I mean? Like, I'd be yeah. like, oh, this is perfect. Like, it's it's a normal name, but it means something to me in in multiple ways. But then I also wonder how that affects things because my dad is like Jim Kelly Jr. So if I'm not Jim Kelly the third, but I name my son Jim, does he immediately become Jim Kelly the third, or does I'm not Jimmy Jim, Jimmy Jim 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 I don't know. This is getting a little overwhelming. I, I can honestly say I haven't thought this deeply into naming nope, kids. No, I literally, Obviously, as I soon Tarzan, as I... Tarzan, that's not... As, as soon as I thought, oh, I'll name him Jim, I was like, but wait a second, would that make him the third? <laughs> well, <laughs> like, can't have kids. Too stressful, can't have kids. Nope, nope, nope. I'm back to, I'm back to square one. Don't want them. All right. <laughs> if anyone wants to give us their future baby names, I hear where him. can they do that? <laughs> yeah, please tell us on Facebook. Search Before My Time will pop up. Let us know what your baby names for your future unborn children are. And on Instagram, you can find us at Before My Time underscore podcast. DM us, comment on the post, say, hey, what's up? You know, in that loot, just give us a five star review right now and, and write, be like, they are so cool. Kelsey's so knowledgeable and Matt's so funny when he chimes in. Just, I wrote it for you. I'm a ghostwriter too. It means a lot, each and every one of you listening. I love you all. Thank you so much for your support. Bye.
You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 